Welcome, my name is Dwight Curry. Um, I'm the Associate Director for Exhibitions and Programs. Jackie thinks we have very fancy titles here, which we do, but none of them are as fancy as clown. Um, but uh, this is our Collecting Recollections program uh, at the museum, and I think many of you have probably been to other uh, programs. This is our first year for this. Um, uh, we have one more program in just two weeks, which I, Jackie is going to share some information about our guest on that one. Um, but just a word about uh, what this program is about. We are collecting um, the very important memories of very important people uh, that will then go into the archives, both as uh, primarily as video recordings, but also audio, apparently. A lot of times people ask right after the program, can I get a copy of that? And the answer is no, you cannot. Um, the, we are not filming these for commercial purposes. These are strictly uh, to go into the archives. They're very heavy uh, digital computer files. So uh, they will go into the archives and they will be there for future use for researchers and also uh, uh, possibly for didactic purposes or for display purposes in the museum. But we are not uh, creating a commercial product. So I want to make that clear. Um, also, uh, uh, when Jackie and I are finishing our conversation, and I'm calling it a conversation today, but I think it's going to be a monologue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as, we, as we're nearing the conclusion, um, I will ask if you have any questions. And because we don't have microphones in the audiences, uh, in the audience, we've, uh, we've handed out little cards and pencils. And if you have a question for Jackie, please write it down on that card. And then Bonnie, who I think you may have, Bonnie's in the back there, will collect those and she'll compile those questions. And then we will ask uh, Jackie those questions from the stage. So that's how our program works today. Um, and as I know, all of you know, our guest is Jackie LeClaire, um, who I first met um, as the ambassador of mirth when I moved to Sarasota um, 12 years ago. And for me, um, Jackie has been the face of, 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 the, of the heritage of circus in this community. And so I'm so honored to be able to conduct this uh, conversation with him today. Just a little bit of background. Jackie made his circus debut in 1929 at the age of 18 months old. Um, so he has 84, 85 years of circus memories to share. I don't think we're going to get all of those here today. Um, he is the recipient. <laughs> I'll be done in a minute, Jackie. He's the recipient of, uh, of the Ringling Museum Circus Celebrity Award in 2010. He is an inductee of both the St. Arm and Circle Ring of Fame and the International Hall of Fame for Clowns. He has performed across this country, Europe, Argentina, Brazil, Cuba, and the former Soviet Union. And I love this. He was once even summoned to the White House to present a gift to America's first daughter, the then very tiny little Caroline Kennedy. Um, today we're going to ask Jerry to, to share his recollections of what it was, what it meant to be born to be a clown, his experiences on and off uh, the set for the filming of The Greatest Show on Earth, and then also what has it meant to call Sarasota his home since 1944. So welcome, Jackie LeClaire. Thank you. First of all, I, want, I don't want to start out with a negative, but I have really, really had a, a, a cold background for a week. I, it's been killing me. But I said, I'm going to make this damn thing this morning if I have to come out in a gurney. <laughs> and I figured, well, if I drop dead on stage, it won't make a damn bit of difference because as soon as they applaud, I'm going to get up and take a bow anyhow. <laughs> and that's the reason. So kind of forgive me if I'm maybe not quite at myself. But I'll, I'll go ahead. Yes, sir. Jackie. Yes. It's been written about you, and you've said it many times that you were born to be a clown. Well, naturally, when you're born in a circus family, uh, my mother and father were on Ringling Brothers and Bonham and Bailey. My father met my mother in 1921, and they were married in 20, met, married in 20, and she went on Ringling in 1921, which is quite a ways back. So then when I was born in 1927, she stayed home for a couple of years, well, 27, 28, to kind of get me going a little bit, and then brought me on the road with them in 1929. And I did stay with them 
for quite a few years. Of course, it was not easy uh, being a child on the circus, uh, having a child on the circus, because what happened in those days is you didn't get a, you didn't get a, a, a crib or a bed for the kid. They, the ch child actually had to sleep in the birth with the mother and father. That's why I had a very early sex education. <laughs> At any rate, <laughs> at any rate uh, uh, so unfortunately, uh, in the early 30s, my mother developed problems walking body. She and, and anyhow, make a long story short, she developed uh, multiple sclerosis. So she had to go home. So when she went home, I went home with her to help. So that kind of cut my early career apart. But uh, yes, that's, that's how I got in the circus. In one article, uh, you said the following. A lot of children dream of running away and joining the circus. I admit there were times when I was a kid that I dreamt of running away and going home. Can you well, tell us about those Yes, things? it's true. Uh, it was mostly later, not really a kiddie kid, but when I went back in the, in the 40s, I was only 15, 16, you know, the, people don't realize the conditions we didn't realize it. We were just used to it. I guess like being in the army. But you know, the co coaches that we lived in had no heat. They had no air, air conditioning. And they had no hot water. And, and all you had on the, uh, uh, on the vestibule when you went out to the, to the, to the Donica, you had a, a drop system. So that was it. And, and it could get very cold at those times of the year and, and very difficult. And, and what would bother me is like we have a cold day with, you know, I've got to remember, we only used to stay out on the road to way up in November sometimes. We played Carolinas and, and Roanoke and all those things. And it was good, get kind of cool. And I'd sit in the bus going home at night, the, the Gilly, you people remember the name of that. And I'd look out the window and we'd go by the homes and they'd see these great big windows in the, in the front of the home with the curtains just draped that way and a nice lamp lit and it looked so warm and cozy and I thought, oh, I wish I could be home. But I didn't have a home to go to in the first place. But it, not, it was not a negative, but yeah, there was times I thought I would have liked to go on home. That's what started all that. I, I, I'm going to ask you a question that I didn't tell you I was going to ask. But it doesn't matter how you The... Uh, in one of the articles I read about you, you talked about um, personalizing your births uh, with contact paper, which I just... Oh, well, yeah, because uh, in the, the trains that I were in when I first went there were the trains that came from the uh, Second World War, First World War. Uh, they were the hospital cars. I think John Ringling North, not John Ringling North, John Ringling purchased them, I think, for $400 a piece. Can you imagine that? and reconverted, and we always called them coaches, even though they were sleepers. For some reason or other, where the coaches, where the coaches. That was the terminology that was used by the Ringling people at that time. And uh, they, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> Personalizing your oh, birth. Oh, yes, right. Well, naturally, we only, that was our home. Uh, my father would always join the show every year, and he would always come with boxes because of things that he needed and then unloaded them in the train. We had, uh, if we wanted to hang any clothes, we had to hang them on the, uh, the little uh, uh, curtain, like, like, kind of like a, a Pullman type thing, but it was just a curtain rod across, and you'd hang the clothes on one end. A lot of people had what they called birth boxes, which was a small box with little compartments, and you'd put stuff, and then you had one uh, uh, drawer underneath was one on each side for the top and the bottom. And the first year I went with Ringling Brothers, fortunately I was good friends with Gunther Wallenda because when you went to get a, a birth that year, you were just a, a, a first to May, and even though I was my father's son, and you didn't get a birth alone, even in the girl's car. You had to share a birth if you were, if you were new, and, which is fine if you knew somebody, because even then they were only four feet wide things. You'd have to crawl over if you happen to sleep on the outside, inside of the thing, and then you had to, uh, you, you had to share that, and, and if you didn't, didn't have a friend of yours that, you know, say, well, like Mary Jane could say, well, I'd like to sleep with uh, Ruth Ann or something, because they happen to be friends or something, but with my case, I with Gunther, because if it didn't, they just gave you a name of somebody, and that's who you had to sleep with. It's the truth, I'm not lying. So a lot of it wasn't really all, all uh, cake and ice cream. 
But you know, we didn't, I, we didn't have enough sense to know. I guess it was, it was not bad. We enjoyed it. And uh, in fact, later on in life, this is a true story, Gunther Wallender, later on, much later in life, he, uh, uh, after they did the second fall with the, with the, with the CBS group over there on, on Arlington Street, and his wife said, well, you've got to get out of this. You've got to do something else. He went to school, and he became a civics teacher at Sarasota High School. And I used to go all the time. He'd invite me to the different affairs. And, and I remember one time we were there, and, and I heard him. He was just to the next to me with some of the teachers, and I was talking with the principal. So the principal said to me, you know, he said, uh, how long have you known, how well do you know Gunther Walenda? <laughs> And I, 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 I knew he was listening and everybody else was. And in my loudest voice, I, I said, well, I know Gunther real well because we slept together for a year. <laughs> That's a true story. It wasn't that kind of a relationship, but it sure got a laugh anyhow. And what was the question? <laughs> contact paper. Okay. Oh, the contact paper. <laughs> well, we tried, to make, we tried to make a home out of that birth. So we would buy that. You remember contact paper? You stuck it up. We would put it on the ceilings, on the walls. We'd put, we could put any kind of curtains we wanted up. In those days, the windows actually opened. They didn't have those shutters like they did later in life. You could actually open. But the trouble was that even if it was a hot day, and the, you could have it open at night and that, but when the train was moving, you couldn't open the darn windows because we had coal locomotives in those days. And all that coal, all that smoke and coal dust would be coming in the windows on your birth, on your, on your birth. So it was not an easy thing, really. And, and as far as uh, all you had is a little, on the end of it, a little galley. And there used to be a little place to cook it. Uh, the porter of each train used to do a little cooking for everybody. And then every, every train had kind of had that. Every train had a porter. and do, So you always knew where there was something because, you know, the show never feeds anybody at night. You get the cookhouse at supper time, and then that's it. You don't get fed till the... We never get fed till the next afternoon because we didn't make the breakfast. Most of the performers didn't. And uh, we would uh, put everything in there, and uh, that's the way we lived. But we, did, we didn't... Well, the two little wash basins for shaving or whatever you wanted to do with them... And then you had the the the, the, the Donnaker in the hall and out on the on the on the uh, 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 the outside, you know, like the trains are come together. One side, the other train would have the Donnaker, and yours would have it on one side, so that you could come through and go out the other side if you had to do. Everybody knows what a Donnaker. Who doesn't know what a Donnaker is? A Donnaker is a very is a term used by circus and carnival people for the toilet. So if I say Donnaker again, you'll know what I'm talking about. What was the question? <laughs> I think we covered it, although I, I am curious about your choice of pattern on the contact paper. Do you recall? I, well, I, don't, I think we got every, whatever was the cheapest thing to buy, most likely, is what we bought. I uh, remember for some reason the blue. Was, they barely had them in all sorts of things. Unfortunately, none of them had a circus motif. But people used to do a lot with contact paper in those days. It was kind of the thing to do. Um, this is a big question. Oh, okay. A big question. I'll get ready. A two-parter. We need the one great memory of traveling with the circus and then the one uh, more terrible or tragic. Well, I think the greatest memory is, of course, traveling with my father and mother as a kid. I don't remember that too well, because what are you, two, three years old, what do you remember? But traveling with my father, I really loved my dad. I really loved him with my whole, he was such a great man to me. Even though one day I kind of sassed him in the dressing room the first year, and he hauled off and hit me right in the face. And of course, in the dressing room, the men were all together, and everybody stops to see what's happening. And he said, look, you may be 16, but you're still my son and you're going to obey me. And I just hated him, just hated him at that moment. I could have killed him. And now, guess what? When I think of my dad, that's the thing I love him the most for. Really, look back on that. That's what thing I love him the most for because he showed me you need a discipline and organization. My father was a wonderful one. Everybody liked my dad. I always remember when I went to Emmett Kelly's, I, uh, 
No, Ernie Birch's funeral. Everybody anybody remember Ernie Birch, Blinko? Anyhow, Ernie Birch, and, and uh, uh, Eva Kelly was there, and she was sitting, and she found, I guess, the first time she even knew who I was, and she come up to me, and she said, are you Jack LeClaire's son? And I said, yes, he was my father. And she said, you know, Emmett always said that he thought that your dad was the nicest man that ever lived. Now, ain't that great? Now, those are the memories I have. That's why I love it. Go ahead. What was the question? Well, I'm going to ask the question again, but I'm going to share a personal memory, and I don't think you remember this, but when the Tibbles model opened, yes. I had a great good fortune to, to go clear around that with you one day. That's right. And um, I remember the moment we, we went in, you told me all about the cook tent, you told me all about the, the curtain going up and down on the 4th of July, and then we got down to the clown tent, and you said, there's my dad. Right. And that, I mean, that model was never the same for me. It was, it was all of a sudden populated with real people, not just little... Yes, yes. Uh, uh, to me, of course, from my lineage and descent, I look at the circus family as being probably closer to me than not my mother and father, but my immediate family. I spent more time with them, and they were always so great to me. Uh, personal things like when my mother became ill, with, she naturally, every year, in those days, we didn't have it. There was no insurances for anybody. When anything happened to anybody, the first thing that would be if somebody fell or something, within 20 minutes after the fall, somebody would be around the dressing room taking up a collection to help, helping, help them with their money and things like that. And when the circus would play Fall River, which is where we lived at the time, all the group of the ladies that knew my mother and uh, from when she was there would come and they'd bring a big basket of fruit and they'd bring her a little gift and that. And one year they chipped in with a man, uh, uh, somebody named Fenner, I believe he was out of Boston. He was kind of a wealthy man and bought my mother a wheelchair, $50. $50 was a lot of money back in the 30s and so she could get around. Well, when you've had that background and you've seen the love, one thing about circus people, they can fight like hell and argue and discuss, but honey, if something goes wrong, they're all there to help. Now, all that's forgotten in that moment. They'll, they'll just dig right in and help. And that's, they're a family. They really are. You cannot, and I, I get so annoyed when they try to portray the circus people and carnival people, blah, blah, blah. They are family. They have their children. They love their children. And, and all they're really doing is selling the only, the thing that they have is their talent. And, and it's, they're a great bunch of people. I love them all dearly. I really do. I love you all. The, um, on that warm note, though, I'm going to ask you to remember a, a terrible time in the circus. Terrible time? Well, oh, God, I will talk about it. The, uh, in, uh, we played Providence, Rhode Island on the uh, 4th and 5th of July, 1944. Now, um, the 4th of July is always the... Uh, American holiday, of, uh, the holiday of the American circus. We celebrate, all circuses celebrate a special day on the 4th of July. So we had, that's the day talking about the cookhouse. Uh, generally when we go to the cookhouse, by the way, it's, I don't know why we call it cookhouse, it's a tent, but we do, cookhouse, it's a tent. We always had a, a side wall that separated the working personnel from the performers. When you went in, you had the performers, you had first the, uh, the musician, I mean the, the staff, where the, got the table, then you had the musicians, then you had the sideshow, and then you had the aerialists, and then you had the acrobats, and then you had way down on the other end went the clowns. <laughs> we were always on the end of the thing. And on that day, <coughs> excuse me, that was the only day that they would take down that sidewall and we all ate together. And they all had little flags on it and everything else. That, that was the thing. All right, well, that was fine. So then we had the fifth. So the next day then, on the uh, uh, fifth, we, uh, fourth, that was the fifth, fifth, we went to Hartford, Connecticut, and we played Hartford, and when we got to Hartford, it was a very small, tight lot. By tight, I mean, it wasn't a whole lot of room. A lot is where we show the show, uh, you know, parking lots where we had circus lots. And of course, when they got there, they thought, well, it's beautiful weather, and, and, and the only way you could get in was from the street. There was a principal street there in Connecticut somewhere in Hartford. Everything else was surrounded by uh, woods and, and, and that kind of an area. So no cars could come in except from the front. So what they did is they thought, 
it's so crowded, let's just sidewall the menagerie rather than put the tent up because it's going to be good weather and that's fine for the animals, they'll love it. Well, that was a blessing in disguise. So then, of course, they have the, the, uh, uh, the sideshow and then, of course, the big top and, and we were dressing, oh, I would say we were, our, our dressing top was not any further than from here to that ca uh, camera over there to where, where the big top was. It was a very close lot, enough they could get wagons through. So we're all in there, you know, most people, nobody worked ahead. We didn't have that big coming stuff like now where they all go out and clown ahead and everything. That didn't happen. If they had a clown, like uh, Otto wasn't there at the time, but Emmett was there, or uh, those, they'd go out maybe a little bit and do something ahead of the show, and then the show would start almost always with the wild animal act. That was the best way to do because they had the cages up and they didn't have their problem taking them up and down. And in that particular year, they only had two rings of animals, Alfred Court and Makova, uh, I guess it is. Okay, so we're in the dressing, we're having a lot of fun and everybody's making up and, you know, a lot of giddiness and everybody gets kind of in the mood. And of course, you know, when you're with a circus, you don't need a wristwatch. As soon as the show starts, you can throw that away because you hear the music and you know exactly where you are. You get, within two or three days, you know all the music, you know, if something went wrong and everything. So we're all there having a lot of fun talking. All of a sudden, we heard this, they were playing a, a reprise of a, uh, it's a ballet piece of music from, I won't go into the whole number because we'll never get out of here. But anyhow, they were, we knew that the animals were being put out of the big top. So the other act knew they had to, to come in, who followed them and so forth. And all of a sudden we heard this crescendo of sound. And we weren't sure for a minute what it was. And somebody says, why that's the crowd. You, people were kind of yelling and screaming, getting louder and louder. So Frank Torrance, everybody, fourth thing we said, the, one of the animals must have escaped, one of the wild animals. Oh my goodness, yes. So he took the sidewall and picked it up, because we had him down low, because otherwise people could look in. And when he picked up the sidewall, we could see the entire big top was in flames. Well, of course, everybody just, nobody even knew really what to say except, we're going to have to get out of here because the fire was coming our way. And the one, my father was an old timer. He said, well, what you want to do, he said, don't worry about your rack, but put as much stuff as you can in your trunk and close the lid because in a flood or a blowdown or in a fire, that would protect a lot of your wardrobe and costumes because it was closed in and we're going to have to get out of here. There's nothing we could do. The, the whole, so we, got, we walked through the woods a little bit and in the back of the woods, there was a little street with a, the little mom and pop store in there was all the performers waiting and I never forget Cora Davis is standing there in her costume with her cape and her slop shoes. Slop shoes are those high wood shoes kind of camaranda type thing that you walk in the ring with so you don't get in the mud and she's wringing her hands. Well naturally she's wringing her hands because Cora Davis's husband was Lara Davis and he was head usher in the big top. So there we are and everybody's looking at each other in the smoke and within Seven minutes, the smoke had completely subsided, and we went back to the, you know, walk back to the to the area. And of course, the whole tent was down. All the poles had fall down. There was only lingering, smoldering, smoldering smoke. And we knew what had happened. And I never will forget it because there was a uh, somehow or other in the. I found out much later when I was listen, uh, read an article that Lawson had written in the newspaper. He he, he confirmed what I thought because I thought why would this this piece of uh, canvas where our sidewall had been taken down that quickly and, and, and of course they pulled the canvas off and that is where they had brought all the bodies. And the reason for that was that was the doctor's tent and in the panic that you go through in life they thought bring them to the doctor's tent, bring them to the doctor's tent. That's got to be the most horrible thing I ever had remembered and I could go into how they got out of it and everything. I will say one thing for anyone circus people or circus oriented that we stayed there for almost two weeks and the only thing that saved the circus really because we lost one a man, a fellow named Harold Kahn and his son left the show. He figured well this is it. I remember my father turning to me and saying Jackie you're going to have a very short career in circus business because he said, never thought they'd pull through it. But when, they, when the train, we finally got permission almost two weeks later to get out, we went in and helped load everything we could that hadn't been burned and hurt, you know, metals and things like that. And we took the train left, I guess, the, uh, the next morning. And as soon as it left the 
uh, borders of Connecticut, as soon as we reached the state of New York, they stopped the train and they brought us all into an office and paid us for the two weeks that we had not worked. And that held the show together. A lot of circuit people don't realize that what, because people were ready to say, well, this is it, now we're not going to go, but they did. And that's my experiences with that. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> we're to the next one. Um, in addition to your years as a clown, you also performed as an aerialist. Oh, yeah, 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 that was a camp. But anyhow, no, I was really. Uh, I, I was an aerialist and uh, actually uh, was one of the doubles. Is it, can I get into yes, that? Yes, please. One of the doubles for the Greatest Show on Earth movie. Now, I'm going to handle only the men doubles because uh, uh, Norma Fox is coming, La Norma, Norma Fox, in two weeks. And we, I had a nice meeting with her the other day, and we decided... Uh, you handle the women, I'll handle the men. Each of the doubles had, uh, each of the stars had three people that double for them. There was myself, there was uh, Faye Alexander, and Trisco. Trisco was a head balancer because contrary to how the movie was really, very few acts go from a, a head balancing act to a single trap to, to a flying act. You know, that was all movies type stuff. And uh, I was fortunately, fortunately, actually, I, I was not even working for Ringling Brothers then. I was back clowning, but I was in Sarasota because I loved Sarasota. And I never went out to Winter Quarters when they had the opening of it. For the fact that I have nothing to do with that. And that, 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 that night, when Bones Brown came to my little apartment over the apartment, $5 room, and he said, uh, they, they were calling your name on the loudspeaker today. We, uh, uh, DeMille wants to see you tomorrow at Winter Quarters. And I said, what do they want to see me for? So I went out there, and sure enough, I talked to DeMille and talked to uh, uh, Pat Fallow, and he said, can you still do the one, one hot catch that uh, it's a trick you do on the tour? I said, oh, yeah, because I've kept up my aerial work, and, uh, and I'll be darned. He booked me in there, and this was an unusual thing because I never had any contracts or anything. It was a verbal agreement, and Pat Fallow said, well, how much money do you want? I says. Well, gee, I don't know. I said, I'm going to go on the winter dates. And the winter days in those days were paying like $150 for the week. And Pat Vallow had known me since I was born. He said, I'll get you $175. That was very good money because everyone else got eight weeks and two weeks roadshow salary for what they did in winter quarters. And roadshow salary was very unusual to be in that money. So I made big bucks considering what it was. I bought a new truck and paid it off and everything else. So I doubled for Cornell in that, and, and uh, I did the first trick. If you watch the film, it's the first trick you'll see in the movie where they're pulling. And by the way, of course, Cornell was petrified of height, absolutely petrified of it. I mean, most of the things you see him do were done very low, but the camera was up from the ground, so it would make him look like he was up there. You can't really tell distance that well. Anyhow, but I, I did my trick. I did it twice, uh, and then... I got all done out of makeup and wardrobe and everything else, and they called me. DeMille says, he says, well, would you come out here? And they had poor, poor Cornell, and they were trying to get into the position that, he, that, he, that I was in when I caught the one hawk. Well, it's a little tricky thing. You end up backwards and all that. So I showed him what to do, and DeMille says, would you do it one more time, Mr. LeClaire? That's one thing why DeMille was like, called everybody Mr. So I had to go back and get in all that stuff and went back and did it one more time. But the real, the, the, the big star, underlying star of the picture was Art Consello, because Art Consello was continually protecting the performers so they wouldn't abuse them. I had a story, Kenny Dodd was telling me there's a story, and it really happened, where they had all the girls up on webs, and they're doing it and doing it, and finally Art come in, he says, get them down, get them down. You can't hold those people up in the air all that time. You know, it's very hard. They were 20 minutes up in the air hanging on a rope. But Art, when it came to the, the big thing was they wanted to have this fall. They wanted to have that, uh, if you remember the picture that Cornell Y was going to show how brave he was, and just before he goes in, he cuts down the net that he was working over. Well, in order to do that, they had to have a fall. And they couldn't do the technical things like they do today. They didn't have that, that way of doing it, so they had to do the darn thing. So they, we went over and we sat in the end ring, and they had a, uh, a what hose, of, what do they call those, dig hose or big hose or whatever, a thing with a shovel on it, and they started digging a hole to, so they have, have the net on top of it. 
well, you don't dig far in Florida and you're in water. <laughs> you're in water, you know. I'm in water most of the time anyhow. So anyhow, they, uh, they put a net on top of the, uh, uh, the ground and tightened it out, but not too tight, with a little softness. And Art Cancelo came to DeMille and he said, look, if anybody's going to get hurt here, I'm the one that's going to get hurt. I want to go up and do it and see if it's not going to kill somebody. Wouldn't you believe that? I mean, he was a man of great importance. You know, Art Kinsella was the man on the show, I guess a vice president or manager or whatever. And he got up on the flying trapeze and he went and let go and went down. And when he went into the water and mud and everything, he came up soaking wet because that's what he went into. But he says, okay, now you can let him do it. So then Faye Alexander had to do this trick. Faye was a tremendous performer. Uh, absolutely, when he did backs from the, you know, a lot of people don't realize that doing flying is not just going over to the catcher, it's coming back. That's the timing and that's when they do all that fancy stuff and only a very, very fine professional can do that. Otherwise, they just get back on the, on the, on the trapeze and go. So here's the way the situation was. He's in the one ring and they cut down the net. And that's right on a regular ring. That was in, they call them ring one, ring two, with three. So I'll say center ring because it's easier for me, center ring. So then what they had to do, they had to take where they were going to do the trick and, and, and they had to spread this net again over this open hole, pool really, and then they had to take the ring carpet from the center ring and bring it over because that was in when, when, he, when he cut the net. Then they had to take the, the net that he had cut and bring it over and lay it on top of that so it would have the exact same thing to go to. And I remember DeMille, and uh, of course, they, they had a big paper balloon. They were going to have him, the camera this way, and he was going to do this somersault through the paper. You know what paper balloons are? Just big balloons covered with paper inside. Well, they found out immediately that that wasn't going to work because if there was a paper balloon, they were going to be able to see him, see him come through. So they squashed that, and what they did, they used ribbons. If you remember the moving picture, there's just ribbons going across, uh, paper ribbons. So then, we, all right, so then they said, okay, we're going to do this thing. And DeMille got on the microphone, and he says, I want special attention. All of you cameramen and everybody here, you make sure you get it on the first take. <laughs> and then they all shuddered, you know. And, and of course, we all were very nervous. Everybody was, you know, there's no, there's no sound, there's no music, there's no, no, nothing but silence when they do something like that. And boy, Faye got up on that thing from the, from the uh, uh, pedestal board and he swang up in the air and he did his thing and of course he had to miss the trapeze and went down into this and praise be God he came up okay and you don't you don't think you've heard of rounds of applause but all the performers and all the uh, staff and everybody in the place really really gave him the applause but I don't think he ever got the money that he deserved for that because that's a very high risk thing and that's how that picture was done all the other things like the head hand balancing all uh, the head balancing trapeze thing they did mostly on the trapeze was built they had another trapeze built that I didn't work on I worked on the regular one was metal and not it wasn't rope it was metal the metal went up through the crane bar and the crane bar was a fulcrum and on top of the crane bar was a bar that you could do this with to make it swing so they could because the person of uh, Cornell and them didn't know how to make the darn thing swing in the first place and Bones Brown was the one who designed that rigging Bones Brown was a, a an aerial bar worker for it and he was up there on a little chair doing all this kind of thing. And of course there was gimmicks and things like that, mostly for, uh, for Betty than for, for Cornell. But you know darn well Cornell wasn't balancing on that chair. When they stuck that chair on that thing, it was stuck in solid metal in something <laughs> that was going to hold up. But he, uh, he, 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 one thing, he was a, a very nice person. Very nice. You couldn't help but like him. And you could never hardly found him. He was always out. And then where's of course Cornell was Cornell. He loved horses and he was always in the back riding one of the white horses. And that's 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 how they did most of that stuff. 
Betty Hutton, uh, Betty Hutton's stories will be told by La Norma. She tell you, she told me some stories the other day that I found very interesting that I didn't know, and you're going to find that if you can get back to it. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to my next one again. Okay. Now, you were an aerialist, right. and you said trapeze aerialists are at the top of the food chain in circus hierarchy. Yes. Clowns are at the bottom. Yes. Why didn't you choose to stay at the top? Well, because technically, well, in the first place, if I'd have stayed at the top, I'd have killed myself for sure. Because, you, well, I was only 18, 19, and, and you know, you, 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 you feel you're immortal at that age. And I was trying to practice more dangerous tricks and more dangerous tricks, front ankle drops and all that heel stuff. And I remember Frank Shepard coming to help me one day. He had already fallen, was crippled for life. And he said, Jackie, it isn't worth it. Don't do it. Do the things that they'll sell, but you're just going to kill yourself. And, you know, you, gotta re you know, we don't fall like in the movies. In the movies, they fall and they fall like this, like hell. In real life, <laughs> boom, you're on the ground. Because I saw, uh, I saw uh, Torrance, and I saw Victoria Torrance fall 65 feet in Madison Square Garden in 1965, and she didn't fall in a hurry. She was killed instantly. So that's the way that went. But what was the question I was saying? Um, why did you choose oh, clown? Oh, yeah. So I, I don't know. Of course, I love clowning. I really did. Now, when you're an aerialist like that, you're a thrill factor, and you're a, a wonder because of your technique and what you're doing. But when you're a clown, you appeal to the heart of the people. You become something personal because the clown is always doing something that a normal person would do and he makes it look ridiculous. So that, that uh, very few aerialists, unless there's somebody comes and visit, they don't finish, the sh finish their act and go out and shake hands in the audience with people or they don't meet, meet them on that level. But the clown has a personal relationship and that's what I loved about it. And I'm, I'm really a, a close people person. It's nice, to, and that, that got me back into it. And it really was, a, another thing with clowning, you can clown on a show for years and years and years and years. Some of them were Ringling Brothers forever because all they have to do is change a little something now and then. But when you do an aerial act like, uh, like Eunice or Latoria or even Norma, La Norma as great as she was, after so many years, people kind of recognize the act with the clowning. And, and I, I've never been sorry about that. I love clowning. Uh, my poor father would have lived. He would have never believed that I've ever accomplished what I did because you know how dads are. But he always used to say to me when I was going to do the trapeze act, he told me later, he says, I never stopped you because I knew if I did, you would always resent me. But I always, and what he would tell me, I hope you save enough money to pay your first hospital bill. <laughs> And that's true, because there was nothing in that. What was the question? You have to tell us about Miss. Jackie. Oh, Miss LeClaire. <laughs> well, what happened is, I, I, you know, I was practicing with Ringling Brothers, 1944 uh, and 45. I was very lucky. Uh, uh, Lalage was a very big aerialist, and her husband liked me. I was, I don't know why, he thought I was a character or something. And uh, he, anyhow, he, he, and he, taught me to do trapeze for nothing, just because he got a kick out of me, I guess. So anyhow, I practiced, and he, he was a German and taught me good form, you know, Fußspitzen, keep it the legs, keep it in all that kind of stuff. So finally, I, I started riding around to different circuses, because Ringling doesn't hire an amateur act or something that's new, and I'd get all these letterbacks from these other shows, Dear Miss LeClaire, because of the Jackie, well, I got a little discouraged, and I, I didn't know. I, I thought, well, this is not going to work out. What am I going to do? So finally, Pat, we had a lady, Cora Davis, I mentioned her before. She worked center ring, did a simulac, what they call swinging tr single trapeze act. And she was pregnant, and she was going to stay home the next year. And Robert Ringling loved flesh and loved the girls more than anything else. He was the first one that designed, had the costume design cut below the navel. That was a no-no in those days to show you navel. Anyhow, so uh, anyhow, that was it. So Pat Fowler came to me and he said, Jackie, if we booked you to do your act, would you work as a woman? I said, I'll work as a chimpanzee. <laughs> And it wasn't for anything else of that. It wasn't something I wanted to do. So I, anyhow, so I had to try out. So they had me in the big top and 
they had the uh, trapeze on the end of the, uh, we, we, the whole tent was up at that time of, in 1944 and then we'd practice in the tent. So it was good we didn't have the problem with the weather. And I had to wait one day and Robert Ringling came with his cane and sat down in a chair with maybe one other person and I had to do the act in front of Robert Ringling. And I was up, you no, know, 25, 30 feet or something like that. And he liked it. I had good form. I had good form. I didn't have big tits, but I had good form. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That wasn't, that wasn't in the script. That wasn't the question. But... That wasn't the question. <laughs> boobs, I should have said boobs. Big boobs. But uh, he, and he booked it. And then I didn't know anything about that. My God, uh, uh, Max Welly came in and did the costume. And he really should have had me with, with uh, uh, kind of lacy thin uh, arms or something, but didn't he? had me dressed like all the other women. And I had to have this wig on with great big feathers. The first time I went up in the rehearsal, I couldn't even get through the trapeze with it. But nevertheless, it worked. And I, I only did it really for, well, the only trouble was I did also did what they call cloud swing, which is another triac that 20 girls in the air at the same time. And Merle Evans had always say to me, because he, he was right there on the end, and I worked uh, the cloud swing on the end. And, wouldn't you know they had me in front of the USO section? <laughs> and Mer Merle says, God, he, he said, if those guys ever knew you were a man, they'd kill you. <laughs> and, and poor Rose Behe, God bless Rose Behe. I'll never forget anyone that knows Rose and the Behe. She says, she says well, I'm glad you came on. You're the only ones that got double pads like I have now. <laughs> she didn't have anything either. And that's why I only did it for two, for two months. And when we went to get under canvas, I said, I, oh, unfortunately, the guy that put me in, John Ringling North, was put out by a coup, and Robert, uh, John Ringling came in to own the show. I mean, my God, he came to the power. Everything that Ringling, well, Ringling had all, these, all this music from my, all the classical music and everything else, and that all came out of the show. And I, I said, I can't do it. I, I went to Pat Valley, I said, I can't do this as a woman anymore. In first place, I'm going to look like hell in the sunlight, you know, and uh, I just can't do it. And poor Pat didn't know what to do, and he said, well, go work as a guy. Well, now, all the time I ever worked as a woman, nobody ever thought I was a, in drag or anything. They had an idea, I looked kind of like a, a mannish woman. I, yeah, I remember somebody yelling, hey, Mac, as I'm going down the track. But let me tell you, when I went back, because the first time I went to do the act under canvas, you know, your mind is on saving your life, and you were saying, I'd, well, honey, <laughs> then I really got laughs until I learned to do all that kind of stuff. But that was only two months, and, and I'm, I'm so happy I did it now, because everybody knew who I was, didn't mean anything, because a lot of things wouldn't have meant anything today anyhow, but I, w I wish that I knew now well, I, well, I wish I would have known then what I know now. I could have made a fortune on Broadway. Um, I'm going to ask Jackie some questions about his time in Sarasota, but uh, while we're finishing up, if you have uh, questions, please jot them down now, and Bonnie or, or the ushers will pick them up. Um, there's just exactly an hour on these cameras, so we're, we... Uh, we're going to have to get Jackie back, I think. But uh, while you're writing your questions, Jackie, Sarasota, it's been home since 1944. Right. And I want to ask you, um, besides your life in the circus, what else has occupied your time while in Sarasota? Well, I, had, uh, I could foresee that even in circus business was going to get a little shaky, and particularly clowning. So I knew I had to get into something, an advocation of something that was going to earn me money more often. So when I was, even several years before, in 1957, I'd gone to beauty school in Texas, in, uh, in May Isabel's University of Beauty Culture, and I got my degree in hairdressing and went right on to a circus in South America. That's when I met Kenny Dodd and that. And uh, then I was in the circus then all again, everything came here and everything else. So I went back to school in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Jacksonville, uh, and I went back and I became a hairdresser and I worked at it on and off for about 20 some years But still was able to do my clowning because it didn't interfere if I had to go somewhere I went and came back and everything and with being a hairdresser it helped and I'm very glad I did because I, I don't I don't think I'd have my arse in a prayer book today if I hadn't done it 
because it's the consistency of income that really makes a living. And I was a pretty good hairdresser anyhow. The women would come in, they have their hair done and they'd look in and they'd say, well, I don't know. If I, I says, oh, don't worry about it, honey. Just tell them some clown did it. <laughs> but I really did well and I had a lot. I'm in Bay Village now and I'm surprised there were some women in there that went to me in the old days and anyhow, whatever. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, if you would, in your yeah. own opinion, in all of these years, what's the best thing that's changed in Sarasota over the years, and what's the worst? Well, having lived here all those years, I would say the best thing is Interstate 75. <laughs> if anybody was here in the older days, all those big oil trucks, gasoline trucks, everything had to come right down 41 and up 301. That wasn't even continued. There was no way to get around at least when they built Venice, they got a little bypass. We had nothing, and that was a mess. And you can just imagine what that would be like today if they hadn't built that. And as far as the, uh, what's happened in Sarasota, I happen to be quite good friends with John Ringling North's chauffeur, black chauffeur, wonderful, wonderful man, very, very, he was just one of those people that everybody loved. And somehow or other, I was on Ringling in 64, and he was chauffeuring John Ringling North at the time. And we used to, you know, we stand outside the trains in those days. We don't, you, you, you visit on the, on the tracks and everything. And we used to talk a lot. And I remember him telling me something that I think has kind of come true in a little way. He says, you know, he says, my, uh, uh, not prognosis, what is prediction. the word? Prediction. 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 For the future, I think Sarasota one day is going to become just like St. Moritz, Switzerland. And I said, what do you mean? Uh, he says, well, in St. Moritz, Switzerland, it, there's either very wealthy or the poor. He said, when we're there, there's very few places that we can eat at, and there's very few hotels that we can stay at. It's pretty much designed for the wealthy influence. And you know, I really think that's happened a lot with Sarasota. Uh, it really has. It's become a very, uh, which is great for the economy and everything, become very wealthy. But there's quite a, quite a gap between, between the both of them. Even where I live at Bay Village, almost 98% of the uh, people that uh, 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 live, in, uh, live in our place, uh, not live in our place, that work there like the, the waiters and all that, live in either North Port or is it Inglewood that's down below? Yeah. Inglewood. And they have, to, they have to commute because they can't afford to buy a home in Sarasota. That's what happened. But the thing is, I'm in the wealthy group. I don't give a hell now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bonnie, do we have some questions? Oh, they're coming. Well, I, I, I want to say that thank you so much for coming. And uh, I get carried away with all of this. But... I really love the circus people and I love the circus world. I was so blessed. I don't know what happened to me uh, and I don't think I've been that good and holy to get blessed, but I am and I've had wonderful, wonderful opportunities, even like today, you know, to be able to live uh, in my retirement. A place like Bay Village is really a blessing. Cause, oh, here we come with the thing. Here we come with the questions. Well, we have quite a few here, so uh, no, we I have I weigh four. 160 pounds. I'm, I'm five feet, four and a half. I used to be five feet, seven. <laughs> um, here's a good one. What were your favorite acts at the circus? Well, my favorite acts were the circus. Naturally, aerialist, because I really always loved that. I, I uh, couldn't help but, of course, I was very good with Lalage, and, and I loved acts like Latoria. Uh, Eunice's daughter, but she didn't. Of course, you couldn't help but enjoy uh, someone like Franz Eunice, who was the man who stood on his one finger. We happened to be very good friends. He was a great, great performer, too. And the flying acts still, I don't care what the heck they do in the circus. Oh, I will admit, when I was a kid, the thing that was the most exciting thing was the cannon, when they got shot out of the cannon. As a child, you would be. And Dorothy Herbert, when she used to come down the track and all, all those those wood uh, frames, uh, those jumps were all on fire and she'd jump over bareback in that. But that, that's probably getting into where I was at. 
Uh, for some reason or other, I don't re remember any, well, Lou Jacobs, my God, you couldn't help but love him because he was such, he was such a clown beyond, beyond recognition of what clowns are. And of course, Otto Gribbling, no question, one of the funniest clowns that ever lived. Very good. That would be it. Does that make any sense? Yep. If you could go back in time, what day or month would you choose? I guess my birth. <laughs> You want to be there this time? No, I want to be there this time. Well, that was the thing. My mother was very, my mother loved me so much. And then that's the reason she stayed home because she wanted to be with me when I was born. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it'd be fun if I could do it all over. I don't know, the trouble if I did it all over, I'd have too much good sense to do all those stupid things that I enjoyed. But that's probably one of the things. I think that, I think, uh, uh, the, the Greatest Show on Earth was a highlight, winning those awards for going in the Clown Hall of Fame and, I, and the Ring of Fame. And for some reason or other, high in my esteem, and I'm not saying it to get a commercial here, I really felt extremely, really pleased with coming in as a circus celebrity of 210. That really hit me very, very well. And those were highlights, you know. Um, tell us about life off the road especially at the Tosca Trailer Park? Well, <laughs> I'd love to bring somebody from the audience up here to, 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 to enjoy this with me, but I won't do it. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, Tosca was really great. Mama, Monica Anastrelli was a doll, a sweetheart of a woman. She was like a big mother running around there doing everything, everybody. And I lived in that, li that house is still there. That's where I was living in when we did the Greatest Show on Earth movie. I had a room in the back for 550 a, a week. And uh, I mean, Mama County said, well, it was uh, right there on the corner of uh, Ringling Boulevard and, uh, and, and Tuttle. It was a fun thing. In the old days, the trailer parks were uh, not filled with motor, mobile homes. They were filled with trailers. Uh, people stayed mostly, came in, went for the winter year round. And it was a very, very homey, fun thing. I, I enjoyed that very, very much. I did live there. In fact, I didn't live in my own trailer. I lived in the trailer by a very famous clown, Gene Lewis. He was on the road and he, he let me have it for the winter. Yeah, I, I, had to, I can't tell all the stories. <laughs> We're going to get them eventually. Um, that does bring us uh, to our close today, as, as, as Jackie has said. Uh, two weeks from today, Lenorma Fox will be here. And then She's that, great. And that will, be the, that will be the last of our collecting recollections for this season. Uh, but we're planning to take them up again uh, come this summer and into next year. So please watch. We're going to cover some other uh, parts of Sarasota history with some of those. So watch your quarterly uh, or your Ringling Members magazine. Um, I, I don't want this one to end. I really don't want this one to end, but it has to because uh, the cameras will stop. Um, but uh, please join us just right across the hall. You can get a chance to say hello to Jackie and uh, share some memories of your own. And um, I do hope we'll see you all again uh, in just two weeks from today. Thank you very much. <laughs>